Let's take a moment now, if you will, to be still. It's a beautiful thing to know that stillness is the one great underlying reality behind all things. We get so involved in commotion and exertion and tension and anxiety in our preoccupation with things out there that we tend to forget that at the heart and root of us there is a stillness. This is but a descriptive term that does not imply anything static. It's truly dynamic. But it's power in potentiality. It is guidance. It is life. It is love. It is all the things that we work so hard for and give so much on. At the root, at the source. So when we say, let's be still, it is more than trying to become still. It is turning to that root reality where stillness is. And at this point, the reality of you is, and it is still, relaxed, receptive, and whole. And in just a moment of realization of this inner stillness, we can orient ourselves in receptivity, openness of mind and heart to deal with that which may come to us or through us in this hour. And then go back on our way in our world out there, just a little better able to deal with things, just a little better keenly perceptive of the source of all good, because we know that wherever we are, within us there is a stillness, a wholeness, a peace, and a power in potential. And we acknowledge this and give thanks for it. Amen. All right, now let's take a look at the Ten Commandments. Recently I, I read a modern parable that told the story of uh, the world at, at a point where they were on the verge of war and the countdown had already begun and the fingers were poised above the buttons that would set off the universal destruction. And finally, in desperation, the leaders of the large nations of the world agreed to call a truce for 48 hours. And uh, the time would be devoted to a council of uh, all of the learned men, the most outstanding men in every field throughout the world who would be brought together. And they were provided with an electronic brain that uh, supposedly could solve the most intricate problems if it was given the data. And so the brain was subjected to a constant stream of expression of all of the finest and the greatest ideas of the most learned men in science and philosophy and religion and all the various disciplines. And they did this continuously for, for hours and hours and hours. Then finally the brain was asked three questions. How can we save the world? How can we save ourselves and our families? How can we live in peace? And then they pressed the button, and the lights flashed, and the wheels turned, and the tapes began to whir. And then the brain began to type out the answer, and it was, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven image. You shall not take God's name in vain, etc., etc. It simply spelled out the Ten Commandments. Well, this was a dramatic plug, obviously, for the Ten Commandments, and it was a call for coming back to the awareness of these great moral principles. 
My thesis, as uh, those of you who have been following with us on Tuesdays, is that, uh, that knowing about the commandments and even knowing the commandments of itself will not save the world if truly the world is in that kind of danger. I have suggested that basically the Ten Commandments as a term and even as a set of values have become a great cliché where the emphasis has been on keeping the commandments, and as I say, we've kept them all right. We've kept them too well, all packaged and, and beribboned and sitting on a shelf somewhere as an example of what mankind should be, but a commentary on what he rarely is. So I say that the commandments need to be broken, and we need to learn how to break them, not how to keep them, to break them down into fundamental principles dealing with the, the great processes of life in terms of consciousness. In other words, the, the need in our society is not just some way to improve the conduct of people or to change the character of people, fine as this is. This deals with morality and ethics and so forth. But I say that we cannot really change lives, and therefore, collectively, we cannot really change the directions of our society until we begin to alter consciousness. Morality and ethics certainly is very important, but it is consciousness that is the key. A person may be very, very morally upright and ethically correct in all that he does, and still, because of the limitations of consciousness, may express and unfold in his life many things that, for want of any explanation other than that, he will uh, judge to be the result of bad luck or the will of God or something else. And what we've said is that the commandments are not of themselves essentially coercive, even though they're set in the form of thou shalt nots, which seem to be arbitrary commands by a dictatorial God. The commandments are not essentially coercive, but they're supportive, principles that support the individual in an integrative experience of life, and that they were set in the, the form of the thou shalt nots because they were being given to naive and uh, unsophisticated and somewhat primitive people, and therefore they were like fences for children. They were guidelines at the level that the people at that time could understand. But the commandments deal with fundamental universal laws, which in this fashion Moses was commending to people, but which each of us must break down into the fundamental awareness or the essence and then make a commitment to them. And this is what we're dealing with. All right, uh, just briefly, let me read the fourth commandment, and I will read it in its entirety uh, because there's certain aspects of the repetitious part of the commandment that is fundamental to our thesis tonight. And it goes, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your manservant or your maidservant, or your cattle, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and uh, rested the seventh day, and therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Now this is the essence of the fourth commandment. Now, this fourth commandment has done more for the observance of religion in both Judaism and Christianity than any other commandment, because it appears to set uh, a special time for religious study and worship. And this is something unique in uh, Judaism and Christianity, which is not found in the other religions of the world. It's rather strange, and yet this is something that, that has had a tremendous influence upon our whole Western culture. Now, originally, these uh, laws, as we've said, were set down as arbitrary uh, statements of, of exact law uh, with certain uh, prohibitions and restrictions and with, with penalties. And uh, the penalty for, for breaking this particular commandment, strangely enough, 
uh, strange to us in a day when we take very lightly the question of, of a Sabbath experience, other than as a good time to get away from work, uh, the penalty for breaking this commandment was death. And we have several references in the Bible, which uh, one of which I think I could mention briefly, the story of the man who was found gathering sticks on the Sabbath day, and he was brought before the elders and condemned to death by stoning, and, quote, he was stoned with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded. Now, this is, this is an exact account from the 15th chapter of Numbers, which not only shows the, the harshness with which breaking the commandments uh, was uh, dealt with in that time, but it also is something of a commentary on the concept of God. When God would command someone to be stoned to death, for picking up sticks, he probably was cold or trying to get some heat for the family or fire to cook on or something, but he was condemned to death, stoned to death, as God commanded. So I think there, there are several important things there. First of all, as I keep reiterating, I think it's important that we, that we keep open in our consciousness and our attitude about the Bible, that we, we see how... Uh, inadequate the Bible is if we accept it on the basis of God's holy word. If we look at the Bible as every word as being God's word, because it, it uh, sort of uh, sticks us, as it were, with some pretty difficult situations. Uh, the Bible is, is a story, an evolving story, of the, of the ascending urge of man. It has tremendous messages for us that are just as, as helpful today as they have ever been. But one has to be very open in terms of, of getting into the flow of the guiding process in the Bible so that we don't get hung up on things like this. We must be very well aware of the fact that uh, because it is evolutionary in nature, the, the awareness of God and the, and the ideals and the, and the cultural standards and so forth uh, at certain earlier dates were far more primitive than they are now. And many of the folks in those days, even those of the great leaders, had a very limited concept of God. Certainly, any, any god that, uh, that would uh, stone a man to death for picking sticks on the Sabbath would be considered unacceptable to most of us today, you see. But again, enough about that. Now, there's a great deal of confusion about this commandment. Um, the reason is it, it deals with what it calls the Sabbath day, you know, and... Uh, and I think that, that is something that, uh, that needs a great deal of, of clarification. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Um, we recognize, I'm sure, most of us, that the Sabbath day means different things to different people. Uh, to the Jews, it, it means a Saturday or sundown on Friday. And uh, uh, to the Christians, except maybe the Seventh-day Adventists, it refers to Sunday. And an awful lot of Christians read the Ten Commandments and say this means that, uh, that we should go to church on Sunday. That isn't what it means at all, you see. If anything, if you want to take it literally, at least it means that you do something on Saturday, whatever that experience is that you're being told to do. So the, the Bible Sabbath is, is based on, as it refers to it, the seventh day of creation, where God worked for six days and then rested on the seventh day, and therefore we're told that that we should have that seventh day as the Sabbath day and should rest. Um, actually, there were many changes when Christianity was absorbed by the Roman state. Uh, many of the days received new names following Roman traditions, and thus, actually, the real identity of the Sabbath day has been obscured. We really haven't the slightest idea today how our present Saturday and Sunday relates to the Saturday and Sunday of early biblical times, because calendars have been changed and obscured so many times. Uh, actually, Sunday as a church day, it may surprise you to know, unless you've been aware of this, the, is of comparatively recent origin that actually didn't come with early Christianity. They didn't go to church on Sunday in early times. As a matter of fact, the the uh, early followers of Jesus were all Jews, and it says they went to the temple regularly, and that was their regular synagogue services, as it were. So the Christian experience, as far as it setting aside a Sunday as a Sabbath day, didn't really come into vogue and 
until the time during the Puritans of England and the Pilgrims in America. And this is why America has had the long tradition of Sunday church going, which is far in excess of anything that is found in any other part of the Christian world. And this may be surprising to you somewhat. Uh, our early uh, pilgrims became very rabid and emotional about the Sabbath, and they had some, some pretty great restrictions, some of which have carried down into our days. There are still towns around New England where they have Sunday blue laws and so forth. And in the earlier times, people were put in stocks for doing the most uh, ridiculously simple things, like it was against the law, actually against the legal code for a person to be found embracing his wife on Sunday on his front porch. And he would put in, be put in stocks for this or put in prison for a while. And uh, there's some, of the, some of these laws are still on the books in some of the New England towns. They've never been changed. But this was a carryover of this rather emotional commitment to what was considered to be the, uh, uh, the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Um, now, this, this whole thing has evolved in America more than anywhere else. The idea that... Uh, that Sunday is a time when a person is supposed to be in church, and uh, it's become a, a kind of a social uh, badge of respectability. And uh, people go to church so often simply because it's important to be seen going to church and to be seen going to the right church and uh, thereby to, to be involved in this kind of an acceptance of, uh, of the Sabbath day um, ideal as the commandment calls for it. It's another thing that, uh, that I th think many folks don't really understand, that uh, uh, today in America at least, and this is gradually filtered out to other parts of the world and back to Europe and in other parts of the Christian world, that the 11 o'clock hour on Sunday had nothing whatever to do with any spiritual significance. I wonder how many of you ever have paused to to reflect upon why 11 o'clock on Sunday has been considered the church time. You know, many have put all sorts of spiritual significance and they've tried to look back into the Bible to find authority for it and so forth. The only reason for it is that people were pretty much uh, farming people and 11 o'clock on Sunday was the Sabbath as they accepted it and halfway between milking times. That was the 11 o'clock hour. And it's rather interesting that, uh, that in urban societies where nobody even knows what a cow looks like anymore, uh, we're still committed to this 11 o'clock Sunday thing, which has nothing whatever to do with the whole religious background at all. Not very many Christians will admit that or even look that casually or carefully into the background of things. This whole idea of the Sabbath in our Western way has taken on some rather interesting and sometimes rather ludicrous and possibly a little bit hypocritical uh, phases. For instance, uh, we kind of rejoice in the idea that, uh, that uh, we send chaplains with our armed forces, you know, into battle, and that they always pause and have their Sabbath time in the middle of a war. You take time out of war when there's fighting and killing going on, and everybody you take time out and you, you go to church, and we say, isn't that marvelous, you know, because these people are are good Christians, are good worshipers, and they're keeping the Sabbath. Uh, I don't know if that seems strange to you. It's always seemed a little strange to me. And there are a lot of other things which we won't get into. But uh, uh, what it amounts to is we've, we've kind of gotten hung up on a literal day and on a literal acceptance of something that it is doubtful if it was ever intended to refer to chronological time. Uh, Bliss Carmen has a little thought, little couplet that I've always rejoiced in. He says, they're praising God on Sunday, they'll be all right on Monday. It's just a little habit they've acquired. <laughs> and you see, the, the great problem of what has been called, and there's a lot of studies on this Sabbath day thing as to what it is, when it originated, and so forth. And it, they, there's a term that's cooked up. You know, I, I, I don't like these, these $75 words, but there they are. It's Sabbatarianism. And the great problem of Sabbatarianism, and what that really means is not the study of the Sabbath day, but the worship of the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day you're supposed to worship on, but it's a worship of the day you worship on. It's that kind of a, a literalism. And the great problem of Sabbatarianism, which is, is rife within the whole Christian community, 
is that it leads to the other side of the coin, which someone has called the six-day closet of unconcern. Because if you set religion as, as an experience on one day a week or even one hour a week, which the Christians have usually done, uh, then you tend to immediately break down into a complete separation what has been conveniently called the secular life and the sacred life. And we have sacred music and secular music and all this sort of thing so that, uh, so that we, we tend to act as if something that happens on Sunday or at a certain time on Sunday is entirely separate and apart from what happens other times. So, so people often say, you know, what's the preacher doing out here? You ought to be back in his church where he belongs. You know, Sunday's the time for that. Let's be practical. This is Monday. You do other things these days. You don't get your, like people say, I don't mix my religion and my politics and my religion and my business and so forth. I, I'm very practical. I go to church on Sunday or I go to the synagogue and I pay my, my fees and my tithes and so forth, so stay out of my hair, you know. And so we've created this kind of a thing, the six-day closet of unconcern, which is an outgrowth of this emphasis upon a Sabbath day. And that's sad. It really is. It's sad. And I think this is the kind of thing which needs to be reconsidered in terms of the meaning of the commandment. Now, <clears throat> as we've pointed out, Moses was setting up guidelines for, for people who were unsophisticated and somewhat primitive and needed directions. So he was, he was setting up fences. Don't do this, do this, and so forth, to help them to get into a kind of a rhythm which they were not aware of. It's a rhythm of nature, it's a rhythm of life, it's the, the idea of the ebb and flow of the tides, the rising and setting of the sun, the movement of the seasons, and even in the physical body, the diastole and systole, the heart, and so forth, that things have a certain rhythm. And the Sabbath day basically referred to the rhythm of life. The word uh, Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, and I may or may not be pronouncing it rightly, which simply means rest, intermission. It had nothing whatever to do as a word with a day, with a specific time for religious experience. It had to do with rest, and out of this came, came the idea of sabbatical. Sabbatical, though today it's, it's a term and an idea that is conveniently taken hold of by educators who often, I guess not as much as they used to, are given... Uh, a year off every seven years to do research and study. You know, I've always wished they did that for ministers because I'd like to collect a few of those years myself. But actually, this sabbatical idea came down from the early Jewish tradition right out of the Mosaic time when, uh, as it was considered as agricultural science, and that was the kind of teaching that Moses was giving, things that were not only religious but sanitary, agricultural, sociological, and so forth, and more emphasis upon the latter parts than on the religious part, that the sabbatical process in farming was that they were supposed to allow, uh, let the land lie fallow for a year every seven years. In that time, it was considered to be good scientific farming. I think today they've proved otherwise. But uh, this is where the idea of sabbatical came. So in the, in the, it, it had the idea of rest in an intermission, a period of, of, of waiting, as it were. Um, now, <clears throat> the emphasis, you see, was, was always on this, this idea of trying to get back or keep into the rhythm of life. And uh, these, these were people who had kind of been out of the rhythm. They'd been slaves, and they'd lost their inward identity. They'd lost their, their sense of, uh, of values. They had lost their sense of relationship with life. And so this, this commandment, more than anything else, was intended to to bring them back and to give them a sense of direction to keep in the rhythm of life. It's like uh, if you're giving uh, piano lessons to a youngster, I suppose they still do this. I don't know they did when I was taking piano a million years ago. Uh, you, you always had to purchase a metronome. And you set the metronome up on the piano and then you began to practice. Da, 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 you know, the thing would go back and forth. And I can just hear that thing today, you know. And uh, the metronome was a very important training device, you see, to, to have the child kind of get into a rhythmic flow and to get a sense of meter when he played. 
Now, you know how ridiculous it would be to have a concert pianist sit up on the Carnegie Hall stage and sit down at his piano and start his metronome going and then play Chopin according to the metronome. It would be ridiculous. We'd laugh, you see. The idea, now some may question this, but the idea of the Sabbath as an experience, as an intermission, as a rest, was a training vehicle to get into the flow of the rhythm of life. Now, that's not to oversimplify it, but let's look at that a little more. In other words, the rest was for reasons of health. All cultures have observed uh, some kind of periodic celebration time away from the involvement of work and labor and so forth. Uh, some have, have had periods of 10 days, two weeks, and so forth. Some have followed the lunar calendar. As a matter of fact, it had the greatest influence, even during biblical times, on setting up what we've come to think of as weeks and months and so forth. During the French Revolution, Robespierre experimented with a 10-day cycle and did this for a good while. It didn't work. It was a failure. And so they went back to the seven-day cycle. And uh, the, the commandment, you will note, gives a great deal of emphasis to prohibition of activity of all the family. That's why it goes into detail, talking about the the sons and the daughters and the workers or the slaves and anybody who happens to be in the house and so forth. You know, it goes into great detail. This was probably the beginning and the origin, and it's the only place uh, that we find through history in any of the cultures in the world where there is, there is an evolution of what today we think of as the rights of workers, that a worker was then given the not only the permission, but given the absolute authority to demand of himself and to permit for his workers and his family a day off once a week. And that was the starting of the six-day work week that, that has been such an influence and in which went on to a five-day work week and maybe ultimately to a four and a three, who knows. But that's where it started. And uh, it's rather interesting, too, I think, rather interesting as a sidelight, which... Uh, women's lib people could probably take up and maybe already have, that in this, in this outline of all of the people who are not to do anything and are to be given free time on that day, one person was omitted, mother. And it's rather interesting when you, when you study some of the very carefully detailed um, uh, restrictions and, uh, and provisions within the the Judaic law relative to this commandment, they had hundreds of them. Things that told you certain things that maybe you have to do and how far you could go to do them. You couldn't walk more than a thousand yards away from your house, had to pace it off to make sure, and if, if saving a life was going to be 2,000 yards, it's too bad you couldn't do it, you know, and all these sort of things. But nowhere did it say anything about a respite for mother. And it's understandable, you know, and it's understandable uh, even today when uh, the great concern is given toward uh, uh, attending church on Sunday or the Sabbath in whatever the religion might be, and everybody is very carefully involved in keeping the commandment, but somebody back home is peeling the potatoes and cooking the dinner and getting everything ready, you see. And it's a sideline, but I think it's interesting to, to see how the commandment uh, was very careful and specific, but it also left certain loopholes. Somebody was always behind the scenes doing the work, you know, and thus I guess it has always been, though that's no reason why it should always be. But I think this is the reason why we see that, that the, the provisions of the commandment being so specific indicate that they related to social customs and to various types and standards that have to be resolved, and we have to get to something deeper, something more meaningful, or we miss the real idea. Now... Um, unfortunately, uh, these things must be adapted to, to our culture and to our circumstances, unfortunately, maybe fortunately. Uh, to become uh, a slave to the Sabbath day itself is like becoming tied to a metronome. And uh, the only reason that, that we do this is because the metronome has me hung up and I do it, you see. So that going to church, keeping the commandments, doing the things that my religious ritual says I must do, I have to do, you know, because I have no other alternative. I'm in tune with the metronome. <laughs> Jesus was severely criticized by the Pharisees for 
doing some work, healing work, on the Sabbath day and permitting his disciples to uh, gather some corn for food on the Sabbath. He was greatly criticized by the Pharisees, and he then made the statement that I think is very important. He says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now, he wasn't willfully breaking the spirit of the commandment, you see. If you'll note in Jesus' teachings, he covers many of the commandments. He says, ye have heard it said of old, thou shalt not commit adultery, or thou shalt not steal, but I say unto you. And then he gave a deeper, more spiritual aspect of the commandment. So in this case, he was saying of the Sabbath day, that the Sabbath is not something to worship just ritualistically. The Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. He wasn't breaking the law. He was seeking to break it down into a deeper understanding of it. Now, the commandment itself, and we specifically read this, uh, is tied to the seven days of creation. And as God rested, so man should rest on the seventh day. But you see, it's interesting that whereas for the most part, and I have to emphasize for the most part, uh, people in the Western world who are involved in this Sabbath experience have long since evolved a, a, an awareness of the creation as uh, dealing with a stage or evolutionary period in the seven days dealing with seven levels of this evolutionary stage rather than seven days when God sat back and said, well, I guess I'll make me a world, and he did this on Monday and this on Tuesday. And on Saturday he said, boy, that was a hard one. And so he sits down on Sunday and relaxes and takes it easy. You know, not very many people believe that literal approach to the Bible anymore, and it's good that they don't. And it's sad, I think, when people get hung up on the metronome, as it were, so that they are not able to get into the rhythm of life as a result of their own inner growth, and thus to see the Bible symbolically as it was intended to be in the early stages, not historically. So that, um, that when we see the seven days of creation as referring to seven specific steps or stages in the unfoldment of the creative process and see it as an evolutionary thing, then we see something very interesting, that the seven days of creation were not specific days or even specific periods when all this was done and then all that was done and all that was done, but they're stages of unfoldment, unfoldment, like peeling off layers as we get deeper and deeper and deeper or adding dimensions, however you want to look at it until ultimately we come to the core or the root or what Tayar may call the omega point, which if you go outward, we come to that point or that level where we find the transcendent whole. And this is the Sabbath, you see. It's where everything is done and then suddenly, to use the language of, of uh, Genesis, God breathed upon this the breath of life and it became a living thing. So it was in that Sabbath rest experience that the, that the transcendent uh, energies of the whole became completely intermingled in the part so that everything became a vital process and we had thus a whole living uh, organism. Now this is, this is something that happens to every person. You see, if you do any kind of a project, you're involved in anything, whether it be a difficult thing that you're worrying over or a creative thing that you're working on, you tend to go through. We won't get too involved in these seven stages of creation because that's a whole other series of lessons in itself. But you go through certain periods and stages, but you ultimately come to a time when you have done all that you can do. There's, you, you, you sometimes say, well, you know, I've done it for better or for worse, it's all done. Or the doctor has, has a surgeon has operated and he finally sews up the wound and and he heaves a sigh, and in one way or another, literally or figuratively, he says, well, I've done what I can do now. It's in God's hands, or it's in the hands of nature, you see. And there is that letting go. But something else has to happen. And that's what happens in the Sabbath level of consciousness. Not a day, not just one time, arbitrarily set every seventh day of the week when suddenly you sit down and, and say, somehow on this day everything has to come together. But it's, it's a level of consciousness. In, in a sense, it's a commitment to the letting go process. How many times we say, I'm at the end of my rope. And that is the perfect time for a Sabbath experience. 
we think of this as a negative thing. Would that we got to the end of our rope more often. In our day, we have too much additional rope. We keep going on and on and on until, as we so often say, we hang ourselves or hang ourselves up on some limited concept. So it's important from time to time that in humility and in meekness, we are willing to say, I've done all I can do. I've worried it through, I've reasoned it through, I've worked it through, but now I've done all I can do, and now I let go. And that letting go is the key to the Sabbath experience, because it's the, it's the implicit step of inner seeking and searching, of meditation, of making the inner contact, you see. But there must be a commitment for this. That's why the Sabbath is, thou shalt remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And a very important word in this, you see, is remember. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. We must be consciously alert to the realization that many, many times throughout life and many times throughout a day, let alone a week, we come to that point where we have done all we can do. Remember. Remember now at this time that it's not chaos to come to the end of your rope, that it's, it's not a case of, well, I've done what I can do, I hope I have good luck, you see. But remember at that time, remember the Sabbath, the rest, the intermission, to keep it holy, holy being whole. This is what the word holy comes from, and it's what it means. It means whole. We thought of holy as some transcendent, spooky kind of a thing that relates to, to aspects of life that we little understand, but we talk about on Sunday. But holy means whole. It comes from the Anglo-Saxon root word, which gives us the words heal, hearty, hail, and all these related words. So it means essentially whole. Remember the Sabbath day, the Sabbath level, where we come to a point where we should let go, and keep it holy, which means to keep the awareness that the allness that has transcended everything we have done, that has been the guiding, directing inspiration, even though we're not aware of it, that the whole that is always in the part now consciously becomes the force that breathes upon it the breath of life, and it shall become a living thing. Now, this is specific, and it deals with such a simple job as typing a letter, baking a cake, working on a lathe or a, a project uh, in the advertising field or whatever, or a long series of, of programs that run years. But remember that there should and must come a time when we let go and know that we've done all now, but that is not a moment of defeat. It's a moment of victory. It's a moment when we realize that now at this point I can let go or as the, the traditionalists say, underneath are the everlasting arms, which is but another way of saying that I'm always supported by the divine processes, not coerced, but supported by the divine processes, but I have to commit myself to let go and let it happen. So remember the Sabbath day. So the metronome you see, which is the thou must keep the Sabbath day. This is the divine decree, as it were. Keep on the metronome until you get the sense of balance, but then ultimately put away the metronome, as Paul says, put away childish things, because the balance that is right and needful in your life and mine is that which comes out of our own rhythms, the rhythm of our own nature. It can't be artificially measured. Who can say that Sunday or every seventh day is the time when a person has the deep spiritual need? Who can say it might not happen on Saturday or Friday or Monday or in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning? Who can say? We can't. And the unfortunate part is we've, you know, I've heard people say, you know, I have this problem and I, I really believe in God, but it's such a long time till Sunday. <laughs> and that comes out of this, of this, very peculiar Sabbatarian attitude about religion. You know, it's like uh, the, the, there's a caricature about this, but this was literally true. A reporter wrote about it when he was driving through the South one time, and he came across a, a beautiful little country church 
with a spire and, and so forth, and it was surrounded by greenery, and it was just sort of like, you know, the little brown church in the dale. And so he, he casually, out of his inner feeling, though he wasn't greatly a religious man, yet somehow people tend to respond to this sort of thing. He drove up to the front of the thing and thought he'd go and see if it was open. He thought it would be kind of nice to walk in. This was the first time in maybe 30 years he'd had an inclination to go to church. But he thought he'd walk in and, uh, and have the experience. And he came to the door and he tried it and it was locked. But on the way up to the steps, over the door in stained glass, there was a beautiful inscription, Entrance to the Kingdom of Heaven. He thought, isn't that marvelous? He said, right, other times in my life I would have laughed at it, but now I have a feeling that I need to kind of sit in that atmosphere for a while. So thinking of this entrance to the kingdom of heaven, he walks up to the door, tries it, and it's locked, and he finds a little note tacked on the door, positively no admittance during July and August. <laughs> Which could be transposed into church services 11 o'clock on Sunday or... or 7.30 Friday night or whatever, you see. And this is Sabbatarianism, you see, the idea that the church is, is the place, this is where it's at, you've got to be in church at a certain time and on the Sabbath day, and that's the day you keep it holy. But we need to follow our own balance, as Thoreau once said, to march to our own drummer. And uh, that doesn't mean that a person just goes his own way and lives in any way he wants because ultimately we're seeking to find our relationship to fundamental divine laws and giving emphasis upon consciousness more than just character. And uh, so that then we, we all need a time, and it comes many times over, when, when, we, when we take the rest, when we relax and let go and get ourselves refocused and centered within ourselves. And that's the Sabbath day. That's experience, the experience. It's rather interesting as an example of this. Uh, I, I think possibly some of you recently uh, saw a special that they had on television, one of these scientific studies of the heart, which I thought was quite interesting. It said some things that I, that I had known of, but graphically they became dynamic. And it was a color motion picture film showing the working of the heart itself. And uh, especially the the very interesting and exciting work of what is called the diastole and the systole of the heart, which is the, the periodic uh, dilation and contraction of the heart muscle, which is this marvelous muscle that is at the center of our physical being that causes the constancy of the circulation and the flow and so forth. But it pointed out an interesting thing, whereas often we, we think about this heart that is always working, and we're, we're, we're always being told, you know, this heart of yours is working all your life, never stops, and, you know, have a heart, you know, really uh, don't overdo, and so forth. But it showed a very interesting thing, that in the, the periodic contraction and the dilation of the heart, that the the actual tensing of the heart, which causes the, the, uh, the pumping action, takes place, and then there's a, a dilation and a relaxation, and you can actually and graphically see how important is the rest period and how significant and how prolonged it is. We're told that out of a 24-hour day, the heart is in actual rest, no activity whatever, for 15 hours out of the 24. In other words, if you watch the heart, it goes and the, the rest is where it's at. And it's in that rest period that you have the key for the fact that a heart can go on through sometimes a hundred years and continue to do its work. Because there is the rhythm of life in which rest is all important. During that time, there's an infilling, there's a rebuilding, there's a there's a contact with a, with a transcendent flow that probably most of us in our lifetime will never really understand. But that's where it's at. Not the pumping of the blood, but the actual dilation and relaxation and rest. That's a dynamic thing to see, and it's a very important thing to know. Because it's this kind of ebb and flow of life, this kind of rhythm of life, with which we must get in tune and with which, obviously, Moses was trying to help these people to get in tune in a very simple, naive way. To get that sense of, of the, the work and then rest. The work and then rest. But truly the letting go process where we can 
be in tune with some of the transcendent forces of our being. Now, so therefore, you see, there's a tremendous discipline required, a commitment to the importance of letting go. It's not just a matter of taking a day off where you go and relax because, you know, this, this Sabbath experience, which has so influenced our secular society, where Sunday is, you know, and we have laws here in our city which, which have very little basis, whatever, in terms of our modern times, where stores can't be open on Sunday, and sometimes there are reasons why they need to be, but the law says you can't, and so forth. And you have all sorts of things go on. The, the police allow them to, and then this opens the door for graft and everything else, you know. All because of, of a hang-up on, on these restrictive aspects of the Sabbath experience. But there's a discipline needed and a commitment to the underlying spiritual awareness of the Sabbath, which is not a day, but it's the recognition of the important resting in what the Bible sometimes calls the Lord or the law. Resting in the law. The letting go. And I like to see this as, as symbolic to something that most of us do probably habitually many times a day. I know I do, and sometimes I'm not even aware of it, and my wife reminds me. But, uh, and that is that you're doing a certain thing that you're intent upon, and you're working at it, and you're sincere. Maybe it's a job, or maybe it's something you're thinking through. And finally, you get to what at that point seems to be, as far as you can go, the answer, the termination of it. Then all of a sudden, there's a... And we do this without even being aware of it. And symbolically, you see, this is, is a sense of relaxing our tensions and getting in tune with the flow. It's a... And if at that time we would remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, that we would see that exhalation, that sigh of relief, as being a freedom from the intellect, from the physical from the worry and the emotion, a letting go preparatory to then the thing we talked about last week, you know, the slight inhale with the God, God is, and then I am. Just a few moments of this realization of the rhythm of the divine process, God is, I am. Just an awareness now at this point, at the end of the job, at the end of my worry period or whatever it is, whether my sigh is one of disgust or relief or whatever, it's a, it's a feeling that, you know, I've come to the end, the end of the rope or the end of the job or whatever, to remember that at that point we want to let go and get that sense of, you might say, a, a physical, mental, intellectual dilation so that we can experience that rest of the divine process which is where it's at. This is where the renewal takes place. This is where the breath of life breathes itself into the experience. And suddenly, isn't that great? Hey, you know, it's marvelous, we say. It's, it's, it's a miracle how it happened, or wasn't it one night lucky, or whatever. We have all sorts of explanations for it. But it's because somehow we got ourselves out of the way and let this process work. That's the Sabbath. Now, this is not to say you see that we're putting down the importance of, of attending synagogue or church on Sunday or going to worship services or going to study activities and so forth. Not at all. Because there's certain aspects of our life maybe where we need a great deal of discipline. Study is a discipline. Uh, going to school, going to religious studies or whatever, even attending a meeting like this is a kind of a discipline. And sometimes we, we need those disciplines because we become so habitually involved in rhythms other than our own. Isn't that true? So many rhythms of, of work and, and reading the news and all these rhythms that we get into that we, that we really get away from our own. And so it's good to have rhythms. It's good to, to go to church regularly or take a study class regularly or if you want to, to have a prayer time on your own regularly. These are great disciplines. But always as a kind of metronomic device which do not of themselves become the answer but are a means to an end of getting a sense of rhythm so that you can follow your own inner guidance. But the real essence and the real meaning of the Sabbath is not just going to the service or going to the experience or even having the prayer time but it's the consciousness of letting go and resting in the law and getting that sense of the wholeness of things. 
It's mystical. It uh, perhaps is beyond intellectual comprehension. Maybe that's why some people needed the Ten Commandments, that you must keep the Sabbath. But work for a deeper realization, a greater awareness of this Sabbath experience of resting in the divine process, the letting go process, where we can get in tune with this rhythmic flow of life which underlies us all the time. Then the Sabbath has new meaning new experience. Then it becomes a kind of a pause that refreshes. It becomes a time to remember, to remember who we are, a time to remember that when we've done everything we can do, there is something within us that takes over. The Father worketh until now, and I work, said Jesus. And when I'm through working, then the Father works. The divine process works. Six days have you labored, and on the seventh day you can remember the Sabbath day. But the six days simply refer to, to the stages of the evolution or the devolution or however you might see it of the experiences of life. But the seventh day is that time, a time that actually intuitively we're all aware of. When we heave that sigh, either a sigh of desperation or a sigh of rejoicing or a sigh of completion, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. That's the time to remember to get still and to get in tune with the divine process. Remember that Sabbath day. And it's a marvelous thing. And in this sense, you see, the Sabbath becomes not a, not a time in history, not a day of the week, but it becomes any time. It becomes a level of consciousness which we can experience any time, any place, in any situation. But like all of these commandments, when we get into the underlying spiritual principle involved, what is called for is not just keeping the commandment, but committing ourselves to the process. And that takes some doing. And that's what we're here for, to kind of make that commitment. All right. Uh, so much for our consideration tonight. Now we'd like to take a few moments to bless and consecrate our gifts of love. And this is a, a very important time for us simply because we know that there is a spiritual process of give and receive, and uh, we want to get into that flow. We want to get into that rhythm. So let's take whatever it is that at this point we want to commit to this experience and hold it in our hands. And I'd like you, everyone now, for a moment, to feel that this gift is what you want to give. It's what you want to do at this time. And so this is as far as the material or the human or the intellectual of you can go. So as you hold this gift in your hands, just kind of heave a sigh. And a sigh which means turning to rest. Rest in the Lord. Rest in the divine process. Rest in the realization that your very attitude and consciousness of giving opens the way of flow that actually causes the gift itself to have a transcendent value and to do a great work. But more than that, it causes you to get a new feeling of being in the flow of substance and open the way for a greater good in your life. So we know together, divine love flowing through me blesses and increases all that I give and all that I receive. Do we know that together? Divine love flowing through me blesses and increases all that I give and all that I receive. Now we acknowledge this truth and we rejoice in it. We commit ourselves to keeping this consciousness. And so be it. <laughs> 